Welcome to our live webinar. Today's topic is ransomware defense using artificial intelligence in cloud and SaaS environments. There's a large number of people interested in this topic. I can tell you we've had more response to this than a lot of other topics. Uh, and there are a lot of very technical people who are trying to figure out how this works in their world. and What does it do with their data? Let's get started. My name is Grover Ryder. I'm a mathematician and a data scientist. Uh, I was originally a math topology underground, uh, undergrad. I uh, did uh, math and quantum electrodynamics in grad school. Uh, for anybody that feels mildly intimidated by that, don't. Uh, it's, I'm a plumber. I deal with mathematics as applied to the modern business problems. I'm not a theoretical mathematician at all. I'm very focused on applied artificial intelligence and machine learning. I'm the chief marketing officer here at Spin Technology, and it's typical of companies like Spin that we have very technical people even working in marketing and sales. In this role, I get kind of a front row seat to see what's happening with artificial intelligence-based cyber protection. It's a pretty interesting world. So first of all, let's start with ransomware itself. Ransomware presents some identification challenges. Uh, for one thing, it's constantly evolving and, and it's got new technology coming in. Uh, it's got new methods, new tech, uh, new presentation and new tricks. Uh, everyone who deals with cybersecurity is aware of the rapid evolution here and the fact that you know the criminals want to stay ahead of the police, if you will. The other thing is that organizations are moving in mass to cloud and SaaS data and applications. A good example is people uh, in general, even large companies don't particularly like to run their own email servers, their own document storage services. People are using SharePoint or Google Drive, they're using uh, Microsoft Office 365 email, uh, or they're using G Suite email, and they're using a lot of other cloud and SaaS data and apps also. Uh, as the people's data and organizations data have moved into the cloud um, the attacks have moved with them so what's going on is uh, a big change in attacks on cloud-based data uh, there's more than a 2x increase just in 2020 some of it was caused by natural evolution of the attacks increasing and some of it's caused by the COVID-19 shutdown with people working at home so cloud data has got a lot of advantages. Uh, I, for one, never want to go back to managing my own data stores and managing my own email. Uh, it's got advantages like sharing, versioning, control. Uh, it's really a great product, but it also presents a propagation mechanism. It's an opportunity for ransomware. And we want to make sure we stay ahead of that. So that's what we're digging into today. So let's deal with artificial intelligence first. Artificial intelligence, in many ways, is partly about patterns, not Everything in artificial intelligence is about patterns, but a lot of it is. Uh, in the case of images, for example, we use things like linear classifiers, K neighborist, and nearest neighbors, uh, stumps, nonlinear, uh, support vector machines. I use SVMs a lot myself, neural networks, uh, convolutional networks. Uh, we have some really powerful tools. By the way, most of these tools, other than the topology based tools, are not particularly new. Uh, because Thurston's postulates were not really resolved until 2003. Topology was a little late to the game in AI, but virtually everything else was already well established, frankly, by 1965. I am constantly using algorithms that when you look up the original paper they're based on, the original publication date was between 1935 and 1965, and I'm not kidding. Why so much from that era? Partly because of communications. Uh, Telegraphs had grown into teletypes. Teletypes increased the bandwidth. Uh, we had things like 150 baud, 300 baud, 1200 baud. The bit rates were going up. Um, there was military intelligence that was interested in signal processing. Uh, there was civilian tele telecommunications work. Uh, we had information theory. Uh, Dr. Shannon's paper was published in 1948. It was a really busy time between 1935 and 1965. Most of the equations I work with on a daily basis come from that era. The packaging's different. The data volumes have gone up uh, 100 million to one. Uh, the CPUs are 100 million times faster, but the actual logic and algorithms are the same. So let's take a quick look at a trained pattern identification. Let's suppose we wanted to train machine learning to, to identify tigers. So what we do is we throw 10 million images of tigers at it, uh, as much variance as we can get, and then we add in uh, 
you know, something, and you don't need quite as many. You can get away with maybe as few as 100,000, uh, but you need a bunch of non-tigers. So you train your machine learning with both a whole bunch of tigers and a whole bunch of non-tigers, and you tell your machine learning which is which. And then it goes through and it develops its own spectral analysis and image analysis uh, and filtering to determine and learn, if you will, what a tiger looks like. If you've done this properly, then you can end up really making advances. First of all, you can identify a tiger, that's helpful. Uh, you can identify tigers with poor resolution, which is very helpful in the modern world uh, because video quality is not particularly uniform. You can deal with low light, you can deal with a lot of variances, and we're really proud of how this all turns out. Of course, there's a few caveats. You could easily have false positives, you could be spoofed, uh, you can have false negatives. If someone sprayed something on top of a tiger, uh, you know, like a different color, you could fool the algorithm. So the solution is not to just check for how a tiger looks. Of course, if you're dealing with photographic evidence, that's all you've got. But not just look at the uh, how the tiger looks, but how it behaves. And that's the secret for dealing with ransomware issues. And we're going to dig into that in a minute. So... As with tigers, so more so ransomware. Tigers aren't evolving very fast. Uh, Signature-based identification is failing with ransomware. If you try to look at the ransomware, two reasons. One, of course, is rapid evolution. And while this may not be obvious to everybody, another reason is if you've cloudified your data, if you've put it in a cloud, you never see the code. You don't get a signature of an app, quote unquote, all you get is the behaviors because the app is outside of anything you can see. It may be attacking through cloud API. So you never see any code to put a signature on. So signature-based identification is going to fail with ransomware always in the cloud environments. Behavior-based identification works great for cloud ransomware detection. They can hide the code, but they can't hide the effects. If they want to trigger their ransomware, they've got to exhibit behaviors that are going to trigger the artificial intelligence. If you have properly trained and refreshed AI engines, and, and, and first of all, there's two important things in that sentence. Refreshed training, that's important. You can't train them once and forget. Why? Because the, the ransomware and malware is rapidly evolving. The other thing is you need engines, not just for parallelism, but because it takes more than one type of artificial intelligence to properly detect. You want to do this in short periods of time, and you want to be able to detect what's going on and then block and reverse the effects of ransomware data encryption, because that's primarily what ransomware does. It either steals your data or it encrypts it. You want something that can scale to cloud user installations. 100,000 plus users would be nice, uh, all proven. So you do want behavior-based identification and you do want it based on artificial intelligence because only AI can really ch catch up with the evolution that ransomware is exhibiting. So here's an architecture, and this is similar to architecture, obviously it's highly parallel, but basically for both G Suite and Office 365, what we do is we use the API to connect with the systems across all of your users, and we look at what behaviors are happening, what kind of behaviors, create, read, update, delete, what we call the CRUD behaviors, create, read, update, delete, copying, compressing, encrypting, and moving. And if you look at the bottom of those swim lanes, what you'll see is there's a, there's a nominally normal frequency of these things that happen. You know, you may read 25 docs a day, but you update them once a minute for 30 minutes. You know, so as you're editing a doc, the updates are auto stored. So the API is gonna record, there's a lot of updates to this doc. What doesn't happen a lot is encryption. Um, and so we can detect, detect these things like overly rapid deletions, overly rapid encryptions, you know, uh, moving. We can detect them by using a network of trained AI engines that talk to your cloud system through the API. So we're using fully authorized mechanisms, authorized by G Suite and, and Microsoft, Google and Microsoft, to access the data. You have to be a trusted partner to do this, of course. And we're examining constantly what's going on with all your files. And of course, you may have a lot of users. So it doesn't do any good to solve this at a theoretical level. You have to solve it at scale. The good news is the APIs and the engines scale with cloud. So we don't have to 
uh, have a fixed kind of resource to do this. As the need grows, the cloud grows with it, and we have yet to run into resource problems using uh, the G Suite API or the Office 365 API. I can promise you those APIs scale to planet-wide populations. They're not the problem. Uh, in addition, our artificial intelligence runs in large-scale clouds, and we've got the bandwidth and the compute power and the storage to deal with all of these different issues. So let's take a look. If you've got someone who claims that they're doing artificial intelligence uh, cybersecurity, what would you ask them? What, how should you evaluate them? The first of all, the first thing you have to ask is what's your artificial intelligence approach? Do you just have a technical approach or do you have clear business goals that you're trying to achieve with the help of AI? So you need to make sure that you're dealing with business protection and business goals, not just techie goals. What problems are you solving with the help of AI? In this particular case of explained, we're dealing with rapid detection and then of course reversal strategies. Is it real or fake AI? There's a lot of fake AI out there. Basically someone hooks up a matrix analysis engine, they've got a static rule set, uh, they'll tell you it's artificial intelligence, but it's not relearning, uh, it's not dealing with nuances, it isn't basically developing its own polynomials to do detection, they basically have a hard-coded system, and that's what I'd call typical fake AI, is a hard-coded system uh, that deploys an algorithm uh, that may derive from the same sources as AI, but isn't being used live to retrain. So what type of AI do you use? Particularly, do you use more than one? You have to use a combination of pattern identification, uh, polynomial matching, uh, projection forecast kinds of systems, and we'll dig into a couple of those. What kinds of machine learning are you doing? That is, are you using artificial intelligence only to detect the patterns, or do you actually have machine learning that can then be deployed into production and do it in real time on live data as opposed to historic data? That, by the way, is one of the distinctions people often make. Artificial intelligence is how we look at the past. Machine learning is what we've trained to deal with the future. Now let's look at the next evaluations here. How does it perform? Uh, how do you train your models? Do you train your models on live data or do you train your models on static test data only? And we'll look at some pictures, differences between those in just a minute. Uh, how long does a learning period take for your algorithms? And the vendors have to have an answer for this. You know, you have to, have to be able to answer it, you know, we retrain this often, uh, our learning period takes this much time, and in fact, retraining on large populations of data can take your models a couple of days to retrain. Luckily, you have working models in place while you're doing this, and then you can swap out and use the new training. What does the AI development process look like in your company? Is it a one-time thing where they glued on some AI or is it actually deeply incorporated in your development strategy? And are you evolving AI as you deal with new kinds of files, and new kinds of behaviors? How do you measure the success of your AI? In our case, you know, we're constantly measuring false positives, false negatives, uh, shadow alerts, uh, timing delays. We're looking for all the kinds of things that could be failing and we're constantly measuring the performance of our artificial intelligence. Also, do you engage customers in this process? That is, you can't just do it in the back end. You have to bring customers in, uh, dig into their problems. You have to do forensics with them and co-work with them to make sure that they understand how you're doing the performance measurement for artificial intelligence. And how do you avoid data pollution? It's very easy to get a bunch of false positives and bad data into your training scheme. You need to make sure that you're dealing not only, make sure you don't have monoculture data and make sure you don't have Bogart data uh, as you're doing your training because it will throw your AI off. Now, let's look and we'll just pick a couple examples here. Uh, this is the set of equations for multiple types of AI such as support vector machine. This is an SVM equation. Uh, SVMs are very, very commonly used for detecting uh, both current and historic patterns. A good example of things that support vector machines do super well is detect sub-patterns and outliers that you may not have found by other means. And so this is useful as a verification method. I wouldn't say support vector machines in and of themselves are particularly good at all real-time AI. Uh, you actually wanna use them to create a polynomial that you deploy into the live world. One reason is, is it's not the fastest in the world, it's highly iterative. Um, neural networks are, by the way, in comparison, uh, far more parallel, parallel than support vector machines, and we use these constantly. Uh, these are kind of the sine qua non of behavior detection. 
Uh, it's a goal-seeking network. You give it a goal, it looks for it, and it's like looking for the tiger, except it's looking at its behavior, not at its, at its image. And so you wanna have a fairly robust neural network set uh, that's been trained and is deployed to help capture uh, events at several different layers. And then of course, you're dealing with the moving averages. Moving averages are especially useful to examine the outputs of the rest of your artificial intelligence products so that you can detect threshold events. So what we would typically do is we would deploy SVMs and neural networks, feed them into a backplane of behavior events, and then we would look for thresholding. Thresholding, for example, would be when you have uh, too many um, uh, encrypted files per second and it's out of bands, you wanna detect that. You don't wanna stop uh, necessary and good end user directed behavior, but you want to detect and stop aberrant and uh, abnormal behavior. So you're constantly thresholding and you have to retrain to do this because individual users' behaviors vary and of course uh, the system varies. And then one more thing, ransomware people try to be sneaky. They try not to create a threshold event. One of the reasons we have to use artificial intelligence is because they're not using just brute force anymore. There's a lot of subtlety. You have to test the stuff. And this is where things like data pollution, pollution and multiple models come in. So one of the things you can see there is, this is an analysis done by data scientists and cybersecurity experts looking at different kinds of malware families and how a particular artificial intelligence, uh, a single point artificial intelligence performs against it. So one of the things you can see, for example, if you look at uh, index number seven in there, for this particular artificial intelligence patterning, it failed on seven to detect. And so what you need, that's why you need a family of AI deployed. It has to work cooperatively and you have to do threshold signaling based on inputs from more than one machine learning and the AI uh, method set. And then there's the testing. One of the things that happens when you use test data, and this is why we put that in the vendor checklist, is if you only test with test data, if you only validate your system of test data, you get kind of that middle picture where you've got this little bit ambiguous platform, but it's so uniform. In the real world, you're dealing with far more faint signals. You have to deal with a set of uh, uncertainty and you have to have incredibly smart thresholding that is not fooled uh, and you don't have a bunch of false negatives. So the, you know, the two things you're trying to avoid, of course, is too many false positives because that puts too much of an alert to the security team and you want to have as low a number of false negatives as is possible. So let's take all this added together and let's take a look. By the way, as I explained before, all of this works with both Google G Suite and Microsoft Office 365. We're gonna take a quick look at a ransomware attack in Office 365, but the same, it's almost identical in G Suite. So let's take a look at this. So first of all, the hacker's got his dashboard. The hacker obtains an email and sends it to probably a system administrator. This person receives the email and it looks like a pretty important notice, security team, and every inspection of this makes it look like it's real. It just looks right. And so let's suppose the person's tired, they didn't do all their checks. They're actually looking at this and trying to make sure their data is secure and they do this. They basically tell the system, yes, please go check my account and secure it. Up comes an authorization screen. This of course is the legitimate Office 365 authorization. It's asking you, do you really want to grant this? We grant it to them and all at once, now the hacker is seeing I've been granted permission and they can see into the files. So they're currently, this is the hacker's dashboard. They can see all of the files in this person's SharePoint. They can also see all of their emails. They can see everything. And so now they activate their ransomware state. And they're, if you come back and you look at the system, what you can see is files are getting encrypted and they can get encrypted very rapidly using the API. So this is actually a case where this person's uh, system has been hacked successfully. Now we're over in the spin one dashboard where we've got artificial intelligence detecting it. And what it's doing is it has been detected within minutes. It's not seconds because of the API frequency, but it's very quick, usually a couple of minutes. 
And then what happens is, is our system spin one blocks the, the malware, blocks the ransomware, stops it from acting on this user or any other user in the network's systems, and then it restores the files. Now, some people say, but I've got backup, I could have done this. Probably not. If a ransomware attack propagates throughout your system and you've encrypted a large body of data, it can take days to recover. And that's something that's super important to remember is you want this detection to be quick, you want the blocking to be quick, and you want the recover to be quick. We've had many customers who have told us that they're offline for as much as three days while they're recovering either their G Suite data or their Office 365 data. This system actually stops that from being a problem and it lets them, uh, it lets them recover. So we do this for G Suite and for Office 365, like we've talked about. The product is called Spin One. And in a minute, we're going to show you how you can go get a free trial for that. Uh, but first of all, let's take some questions. And we do have some questions here. I'm going to the question panel now and taking a look. Okay, so the first question I have is, um, other than ransomware, what does the system do? Well, it does a lot. Uh, it does uh, file backup. It does uh, file restore. It does uh, some user management. Uh, it can check for uh, rogue uh, browser extensions. There's a lot. And so what I kind of recommend is, is that you contact us and get a demo to see it all. Uh, this particular live event is focused on artificial intelligence. So I'm mostly dealing with simple ransomware use case, but there are a fair number of sophisticated features in Spin One. I'm not going to cover them all. Um, the next question is, um, okay, this is, there's two or three of these. How does it impact performance? And the answer is you'll never see it because it's completely parallel. Uh, we're accessing the G Suite API uh, or the Microsoft Office 365 API independently of your access to it. So we're accessing it through administration channel and you know across our own cloud network. Uh, it's all cloud to cloud, so it's very fast. We don't have the same challenges you might have with an end user you know, home network. We got peering data, so we're very fast. We can access it, we're highly parallel, and there is no performance impact that's observable or measurable by having this system installed, um, which is not true for some in firewall backup. So this is this is a completely different kind of thing. Uh, the the uh, and, and it's also true, by the way, with some on laptop anti-malware, which really slows down your system. This does nothing like this. It basically allows G Suite or uh, Office 365 to perform normally, and in parallel, it's doing the ransomware detection and analysis constantly. Another question I've got here is, uh, this person says, I've got more than 30,000 users. Does it work for that? Uh, yes, we've had this proven and installed in multiple instances, far, far larger than 100,000 users. I can't say exactly how big, but it's really big. This has been proven across everything from small accounts with two G Suite users uh, to very, very massive accounts with hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, the scale works fine. So uh, I've got some other questions here that look very environment specific. If you've asked an environment specific question, uh, we'll get back to you. We've got your email address. We'll just shoot you back a quick answer. Uh, I would encourage people to uh, go to our website and either get a free trial or to uh, ask for a demo. Uh, there is a free trial. Um, these are, by the way, both in the, the, those links that you'll see there go right to the stores. So uh, the spin for G Suite, if you click there, it actually goes to the Google store, uh, where, by the way, we have a five-star rating. Uh, and if you go over to the Office 365, we also have a great rating, and it's right on the Azure storefront. So these go right to the store. Uh, these have been trusted and approved by these, uh, by these great vendors, and we work very closely with them. This is pretty important stuff. So if you've got any questions, uh, shoot us back an email. You can just respond to the email that, that, uh, that sent you the last invitation for this, or you can go to our website at spin.ai and uh, do a contact or a, a request a demo. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you for attending this event. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. We enjoy talking with technical people about how artificial intelligence is deployed. And if you have any more questions, go to our website. This event has been recorded and we'll make the recording available to anybody who wants it. Like I said, if you've got any questions, you need more information, just go to spin.ai and, and do a connect. Thank you very much. We'll end this event now.